Hi, my name's Tyler Moore, and this is my wife, Wendy Moore, and we're here to tell our story. So we've been married for 25 years, and we've had the typical American family life. We got married, started having kids, uh, started going into debt, uh, we bought a house, got credit cards. So we thought everything was going good until the recession hit and we were both laid off. And that was devastating because we were so upside down, we didn't even know where to go from there. And we ended up um, getting really close to divorce. And we had to file for bankruptcy. That started the downward spiral and then we went from there and then we started having to go to counseling. So I was ready to be done. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to continue being married because I felt like everything was on my shoulders and I wasn't getting any help. And I wasn't communicating it very well either. Um, Tyler convinced me to go to counseling for our marriage and that changed everything because our counselor challenged us to get back to going to church more regularly. And um, that was one of the big things that helped us. When we started coming to Calvary, um, I heard right, you know, right off the bat, Ephesians 5.33, which says, husbands are supposed to love their wives and wives are supposed to respect their husbands. And that really affected me. And I knew that I was disrespecting Tyler by not supporting him and not, um, not being the wife that I should be. So um, that was something that really convicted me. And God showed me that I needed to work on that part of myself, which I did. I, I really started supporting Tyler and, and um, lifting him up and encouraging him. And um, things really took a turn in our marriage. So God fixed our marriage, definitely, but our finances were still a mess. Um, after we uh, declared bankruptcy, uh, we got right back into the credit cards and car debt. We, we just did the same thing over again. We didn't learn. So we didn't fix that part that, that was broken. We, we were doing well as a couple, but our finances were still a mess. So a couple years ago, uh, Calvary was offering Financial Peace University. And um, I really felt it tugging on me. And I talked to Tyler about it, and he committed to going which was awesome. Of course, it was Sunday at 11 o'clock, which is football day. <laughs> yeah, definitely was football day. But I came for the class because I wanted to make sure that we got back on track and I wanted to be there for support for my wife and for our family. So football at that point wasn't what I needed. I needed to get plugged back into my family and start getting us back on track. Mm -hmm. And it has made our marriage a lot stronger since we been did take the class and we've gotten better. We sit down all the time. Um, I'm kind of more of the free spirit and she's kind of more of the nerd. So she kind of, <laughs> yes. you know, handles most of it, but I, I'm there to help her out and we figure we out. We work together. Yes. We do. Uh, hey, uh, I'm glad you're here tonight. Uh, today, I, I want to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. If uh, you're at our Parker campus, there's a table of Bibles on it right back in the middle. You can go back there and grab one of those. If you're here at our Sweetwater campus, then uh, they're in the seats around you. If you don't have a Bible, then go ahead and grab one of those and turn to page 1053. 1053, you'll find John chapter 1. And as always, uh, if uh, you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, then please take one of those with you because we want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. 
Hey, uh, let me just tell you about a couple of things I'm really excited about before uh, we dive into the message. The first one is that uh, I'm just excited to be here. Uh, I have been sick all week. Uh, I had that crud stuff that's going around, uh, which is why I wasn't out sharing it with you before the service, uh, And uh, although I'm feeling much better. But this is my first like episode out of the house in, in like five days. And boy, it feels good to be free, doesn't it? The... Uh, on the other hand, if I cough up a lung while I'm preaching, you'll understand why. So uh, anyway, uh, it's just great to be here, great to see you, glad that you are feeling well enough to be out and about as well. The other thing I'm excited about is the Night to Shine is coming up in less than a month. We're going to be hosting that, that prom for special needs, and I hope you're as excited as I am because this is one of those opportunities to connect with a lot of people who may or may not know the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And this is an opportunity for us to serve our community. And, uh, and I was told we need about 100 more volunteers of people who just are willing to be the buddies for the special needs adults that are coming to the, to the prom. And, uh, and I can't think of a better way for you to spend an evening than hanging out with somebody and being their personal champion, cheerleader, encourager, friend, uh, whether they want to bust a move on the dance floor or go sing karaoke or go play some games or just go hang out at the buffet. Uh, and uh, you're talking about being able to be the hands and feet of Jesus in maybe the simplest way ever, most delightful way, most fun way ever. And if that, if that fits in your wheelhouse, can I just encourage you, before you leave today, to sign up at the tables that are available out in the lobby uh, at all of our campuses for Night to Shine. It's, it's just an opportunity. Uh, a few months ago, we talked about Matthew 25, about seeing people as Jesus, the least of these. He said, if, as you've done this to the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it to me. That's what we're doing. And, and this is an opportunity to go and hang out for a night, if you will, with Jesus. Because that's how he sees it. And that's how he sees them. Because everyone is created in the image of God and valued by God and loved by God. And we want to love them and celebrate them that evening. We want to do it every week, every day, but that's an opportunity to do it specifically. So we are continuing our Unleashed series. We want to talk about how God wants to set us free, how he wants to change our lives so that we can live as the children of God that he created us to live. And there's so many things that hold us back, so many things that prevent us from doing that. And uh, today we're talking about our identity. So who are you? I mean, really, who are you? Uh, how you answer really matters. And so what we're going to do this weekend is kind of provide an identity check. And, and we're all used to those, right? You've been to the airport, you, you want to get on a plane, what do you have to show? Your, your boarding pass and your ID. And guess what? They better match or you're not getting on the plane, right? You ever had the travel agent or the airline do a typo and you got to go fix it and how much hassle that is? Yeah. Or, or if, uh, you know, one of our nice law enforcement officers pulls you over and wants to have a conversation, they usually want to see what? You know, your ID and your registration, and they better be up to date and accurate or you could be in trouble. Or if you want to volunteer with kids here at Calvary, guess what? You better show us an ID and pass a background check. Because if you aren't telling the truth or you're a danger to our kids, you're not getting anywhere near the children. So who are you? If your declaration of identity doesn't really match your life, then what are you? See, that's what a hypocrite is. Somebody who says they're one thing but lives another. And hypocrites hurt the kingdom of God. They push people away from Jesus uh, because hypocrites are, are living imprisoned by a facade, by untruths. And Jesus wants to unleash us to live for him. So today, I want to challenge us to do an identity check together. John chapter 1, I want to pick up in verse 9. This is the Apostle John writing about Jesus and writing about Jesus coming into the world. So listen to what he says. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, 
who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Uh, this is about our identity. And so let's do this identity check together. And, and it's really a series of statements. The first one is this. You are a follower of Jesus. Now, I could put a question mark on that and say, are you a follower of Jesus? But the beginning point, if we're doing an identity check, is to be a follower of Jesus. And <clears throat> in John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, here's what qualifies you as a follower of Jesus. You received Jesus you believed in Jesus, and you became children because of Jesus. And so the first and most important identity check that you can have is this. Are you a child of God? Are you a child of God? Now, lots of people like to proclaim, we're all God's children. You ever heard someone say that? Maybe you've even said that. Oh, we're all God's children. It's false. It's not true. It's not accurate. It's not what Scripture says. We just read it uh, according to John chapter 1. Who are God's children? Who are His children? Those who have received Jesus. Those who have believed in His name. Those are the children of God. See, lots of people want to claim the identity of Christian. Lots of people are religiously active in churches. You know this. I know this. We're, we're around people that all the time. Oh yeah, I believe. I believe. But have they experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus? <clears throat> have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus? Have you been adopted into God's family? Because that changes everything. Did you notice again? Listen to this. It's so clear. But to all who received him, he, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You weren't children of God, and now you are children of God. And it wasn't because of someone else's decision. It was a God thing. And we are different because of that relationship with Jesus Christ. That changes everything. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> or as we often say at Calvary. See, there we go. Thank you. Yes, right. Give him a hand. I hadn't been choking on my voice all week, but then I haven't been talking. So what do you know? So, as we often say at Calvary, you can't follow Jesus and stay the same. You can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. So, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, then, <coughs> and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you're a follower. But if you haven't done that, then surrender today because it's the only way to freedom. It's the only way you're going to get to life. It's the only way you're going to become a child of God. So, this identity begins with, you're a follower of Jesus. You've got to answer the question, are you? If you can't answer that, then please see us after the service. See one of our prayer team members after the service. See one of our pastors after the service because we want to make sure that you're a follower of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then you are a servant. You're a servant of God. Okay? First identity, follower of Jesus. Second identity, servant of God. <coughs> so Jesus is talking to his disciples after the resurrection, John chapter 20, and he says, as the Father sent me into the world, I'm sending you. Okay, as God sent me, I'm sending you. So what was Jesus' primary identity in the world? During his ministry, how did Jesus identify himself? He called himself a servant. Think about what he said, again, to his disciples. Matthew chapter 20. Jesus is talking to them. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They're, they're saying, hey, I, I want to be number two and three. And the disciples are, are getting into, you know, angry at each other about who's lobbying for position. You know what Jesus says to them? You guys got it all wrong. You guys have it completely wrong. You don't understand. It's not about who's going to be great. It's about who's going to be the servant of everyone. And he said, if any of you wants to be great, you have to be the servant of 
all. And then he said this, for the Son of Man himself, Jesus said, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The example that Jesus said, he goes, hey, here's what it means to be great in the kingdom, to be a servant. That's what I'm here to do is to serve. Then a few weeks later, Last Supper, you may or may not know this, John chapter 13, Jesus is there with the disciples. He institutes the Last Supper. You know what he does? He goes, I want to show you something. He gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the feet of the disciples. He, he physically served the disciples. He took on the role of the lowest servant in the house and, and he washed their feet and he said, what I've done to you, you do to one another. If I'm greater than you as your master, and I am, then you ought to serve one another. He's a servant. That's his identity. The guys that followed Jesus, that wrote the New Testament, they took on the role of a servant. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle James, the Apostle Jude, all these guys. Books of the New Testament, you know how they identify themselves? A servant. A servant of Christ. So our identity is a servant. Jesus said, this is how the Father sent me into the world. This is how I'm sending you into the world. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then you're also a servant of God. You can't really escape the identity as a servant of God. So two things to know about being a servant, okay? And, and, and this applies to all of us. The first one is this. You're accountable for your life. You're accountable for your actions, your choices, we're not talking about heaven or hell because that's determined by your first identity <coughs> understand you're going to go to heaven because of jesus and if you receive jesus and you believe in his name then you're a child of god and your eternity is taken care of all right you got that this is, we're talking about grace and grace is really cool and grace abounds so if you can check the box identity number one you're a follower of jesus then heaven is your, your destination. So we're not talking about heaven and hell. What we're talking about is you answering to God as a servant of God for how you live your life for God. Because we are all accountable as servants. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this. And again, he's writing to the church. He's writing to Christians. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We must all face Jesus and answer for how we live our lives as servants. That's accountability. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul talked about our life's work being tested as by fire. He said, and if the works are burnt up you still get to go to heaven but if they survive then you're going to be rewarded and then of course jesus parables you know we preached through the parables we talked about the moral of the story <coughs> about half the parables involve servants who are held accountable for their actions and some of them are rewarded and some of them are not we are going to be accountable look grace is real and grace is wonderful <laughs> because grace means that even though you and I deserve hell, what do we get? Yeah, we get heaven. That's grace. That's the definition right there. You deserve hell, you get heaven because of Jesus. That's grace. So rejoice in that, celebrate that, live in that, but also know that God is going to hold us, his servants, accountable for the choices that we make, for how we live, for how we love, and for how we invest our lives. Nobody escapes accountability. No one. So knowing that, what do you want to hear when you're face to face with Jesus? Say, what, what, what do you hope that episode involves? Do you want it to simply be an I'm sorry I screwed up? Or do you want to hear well done, good and faithful servant? See, I want to hear that. But that's only going to happen if we pass the identity check, if we understand not only are we followers of Jesus, but we're servants of Jesus. And as servants, we're accountable for our life. And as a servant, you're a steward. 
you're a steward. Now, if you don't know what a steward is, it's a manager, it's a caretaker. It's somebody who's been entrusted to care for the possessions of someone else. And if you see the parables that Jesus told, most of the time, servants in the parables are stewards. The master said, take care of this for me, and you're responsible for it. <coughs> in other words, if our identity is in Jesus... We're stewards, which means we don't actually own anything. Let me say that again. If our identity is in Jesus, and we understand that we're a servant, we understand that as servants we're stewards, we don't own anything. We recognize that God has given us the things that we have, and we are managing it for God. Now, if you understand and embrace this truth, it's going to set you free. You're going to be unleashed from that selfish tendency uh, that all of us have. You know, the one that is manifest in um, toddlers? I have two one-year-old grandchildren. They are beautiful, they are wonderful, and they are selfish. Okay? Mine. And they, and they fight over stuff, and it's, it's wonderful to see, but it's also uh, just you're sitting there going, oh, Sin is strong in this one. <coughs> because it's true for all of us, right? See, we just learned to hide some of our selfishness. The reality is that um, we're a lot like the seagulls in Finding Nemo. And if you don't know that scene, YouTube it. Uh, it'll show up pretty easily. It's all mine, mine, mine. So ask yourself this identity check question. This is hard. Is it mine or does it belong to God? Now, you know the church answer because I already gave it to you. You know what you're supposed to say, but this isn't about giving the church answer. This is about being brutally honest before God because he already knows your heart. He already knows how you're living. He already knows what you're doing with it, but how do you live this out is it yours or is it God's? See, as stewards, we're going to give an account. So let's talk about what God is going to actually hold us accountable for. Okay, what is he going to actually look at us and say, hey, I entrusted you with this. What did you do with it? Because I think there's, uh, as a steward, you are entrusted with three things that are important to God. Priorities, if you will, spelled out in Scripture. And the first one is we've been entrusted with mission. Entrusted with mission. Matthew 28, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay? Great commission. Go and make disciples. Luke chapter 19, Jesus said, uh, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. The mission is a priority to Jesus. And so God has entrusted his life-changing mission into our hands. And he expects us to make a difference in this world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because what did he say? Again, right before he ascended, he said, uh, hey guys, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you are going to be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. It's all yours. Go and do it. That's Jesus' mission. So, <coughs> so how are you a part of that mission? Right now, as, as God's servant, how are you participating in his mission? How are you using your talents, your experiences, your gifts to lead people to Jesus? Um, you know, that is kind of our mission here at Calvary. Are you guys are familiar with that? We exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So how are you tapped into that? How are you a part of that? Uh, are you serving at Calvary? <clears throat> are you part of our first impressions team? You know, welcoming people, making them feel like they're wanted here. 
because we want them here, but uh, we need people to communicate that. Uh, what about our tech team? Do you guys think that, you know, we sound this good or look this good just on our own? <laughs> it is all the, the magic of the tech. So it doesn't happen without them. And uh, in fact, my voice would sound normal if I hadn't offended them earlier. Uh, <coughs> or what about Calvary Kids? We've got over 300 children a weekend that are coming and participating here at Calvary at all of our campuses, and we need people who love them and want to teach them and, and help them grow. What about the worship team? I know some of you, that's your dream. You just, God just didn't bless you that way. Uh, but, you know, some of you have talent and, and you're sitting on it. What about leading life groups or, or visiting the hospitals or, or, or helping with the baptisms or, you know, all kinds of things. Are you serving through Calvary? Or maybe you're serving in the community to promote Jesus. You know, we've got Night to Shine coming up. I already talked about that. Huge fan. Plug in. Be a part of it. Let's bless our community in Jesus' name. It's a way to lead them to that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Uh, or maybe participate in, in <coughs> one of our other community events, Teacher Appreciation. Helping out with the Balloon Festival. I know a lot of you did that. Just being there and saying, hey, I represent Jesus in this place. Or are you using your career to promote Christ and Calvary? You know, how would we do that? I don't, I don't know how to represent Jesus in my job. Really? You know, the, the, the two best evangelists I've known since I've been here at Calvary were a physician and a counselor. Physician and a counselor. They just were talking to people and saying, hey, do you have a church? I know a good one. That's it. So as a servant of God, you're entrusted with and accountable for the mission. How are you plugged in to the mission? And, <coughs> pardon, sorry, I'm going to get through this. And hopefully you will too. But as a steward, you're also entrusted with people. God entrusts us with people, right? In Mark 12, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the first and great commandment. The second is like it. What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. God has entrusted you with people to love and to lead to Jesus. <coughs> Family, <coughs> friends, co-workers, neighbors, strangers, all of them are part of your world. And it all begins with your family. You want to be a faithful and effective servant? Love your spouse, love your kids, even love your siblings. Okay? That's reality. That's where it begins. Jesus entrusted you with people, and he wants you to love them, and he wants you to lead them to Jesus. So, are you loving your family? I mean, you heard Tyler and Wendy's testimony about you know, it started off with them and their relationship with each other and how God redeemed that. Are you loving your family? Because love is patient and love is kind. Is that how your spouse sees you right now? Your kids, your grandkids see you right now? Is that who you are to them? And are you leading them to follow Jesus? In other words, is worship a priority? Is life group a priority? Is serving a priority? Or is... God an afterthought in your family. You see, as a steward, God has entrusted you with people and you are accountable for how you love and how you lead them. Let me say that again. As a steward of God, God has entrusted you with people and you're accountable for how well you love them and how well you lead them. And then finally, as a servant of God, he has entrusted you with resources. We are stewards of God's resources. By the way, stewards are always the people who manage the money. And after all, God created it all. Uh, God owns it all. And God has given us the money, the possessions, and the skills that we possess that create money and opportunity. Again, we don't own it. We don't own it. It's not ours. It belongs to God. But I, I share that with you knowing <coughs> this is a challenge point for every single follower of Jesus. 
We don't own it, but it's ours. How do we navigate this? This is one of those huge, you know, just obstacles that is in the way of us following Jesus and understanding this identity, again, will set us free. God has given you resources. So do you live as if it's your money, your house, your car, your business? Or do you live as if it's God's money and God's house and God's cars and God's business? Because one day we're going to give an account to the master for how we managed his resources. And here's what Jesus said, Luke chapter 12. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the ones who have been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. In other words, if God has blessed you, God expects more of you. Now, right away, the, our default thinking is, well, good thing that I don't have much. <laughs> and I don't have as much as they do. They really got to worry about that. I don't have to worry about much. I don't have much. Really? Really? You don't have much? Because from where I stand, you guys are filthy rich. I mean, come on. We live in the United States of America in 2020. We won the lottery of history, people. We, I mean, if you're poor here, I mean, if you're poor in America, you live below the poverty line, I got news for you. You still got more than 90% of the world at your disposal, your level of, of comfort. So don't think that, you know, you're excused. Um, and by the way, if God has blessed you with much by American standards, guess what? Did you hear what Jesus said? To everyone who has been given much, much will be required. The one who's been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. He expects more. So what does God expect his stewards, his servants, to do with his money? Um, here's a couple things. They're not in your notes, so you might want to jot them down, or you might want to just, you know, tune me out since you don't want to hear this part anyway. Uh, first of all, he expects us to live responsibly. To live responsibly, to pay our bills, to save, to live within our means. Okay, to be responsible citizens. He, he expects that. Okay. Uh, I heard, this, this absolutely blew my mind, that banks don't want to lend money to preachers because preachers don't pay their bills. That, that is really tragic, isn't it? That is really tragic. I, I don't know, you know, uh, but I've heard that my whole life, and, and I, I've lived to try to, to counter that. But we ought to live responsibly. Secondly, God expects his servants to invest in his kingdom. To invest in God's kingdom. Now, uh, I promote tithing, which is giving 10% of your income to God, okay? The tithe, it's biblical, it's Old Testament, you know, God told his people, Israel, to give a tithe to show that they trusted him, and Jesus affirmed that, and I believe that when we tithe, what we're saying is, God, I recognize that you own it all, and so I'm going to give back to you what you ask, okay? It doesn't end there, in fact, Jesus kind of said it starts there. He wants us to actually give sacrificially. But it, it, that's where it begins, with 10%. Some of you are like, no way. Am I giving God 10% of my income? And which means that you haven't really answered the identity question correctly yet either. Are you a servant? Are you a steward? Is it God's or is it yours? But, uh, so I encourage tithing. Uh, Jesus said, you know, pretty much give it all because he owns it all. So the tithe sounds really good to a lot of people. Uh, but invest in God's kingdom, beginning with the local church and going outward from there. And then third thing is, is simply be generous. When you can help somebody, help somebody. When you can bless somebody, bless somebody. You know, uh, be generous toward the wait staff. You should be kind and patient with them as well. But be generous for sure because you represent Jesus and, and he's not cheap because his grace is free and it changes our destiny. So that's the identity check. So who are you? Hopefully, you're a follower of Jesus, you're a servant of God, and you are a steward who is expecting accountability from your Savior, and you're ready to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, if that's not you, 
we want to talk because we know that Jesus can change your life. In fact, that's what he came to do. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for a patient audience that listens through a, a preacher who can't hardly talk tonight. Thank you for your spirit who doesn't need eloquence or uh, skill to communicate truth. And God, thank you that you have loved us and you have saved us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God, I know this room is mostly filled with people who already love you, who already have claimed you as Savior, who are followers, and they know that. But today, we want to be more than that. We want to be servants. We want to be stewards. We want to be faithful. We want to live knowing that there's accountability, and we want to look forward to that and not dread it. So God, unleash us from the selfishness or the greed or the pride that gets in the way of us being the people that you created us to be, that you've called us to be, that you've saved us to be, that you've sent us to be. God, we want to be faithful. We can't do it without you. And so today, we simply praise you because Jesus is the name that is above every name. So in the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen.